Hello, and welcome to the Armstrong Browning Library's Benefactors Day celebration. I'm Jennifer Borderud, Associate Librarian and Director of the Armstrong Browning Library, and I'm so pleased to have you all joining us virtually today. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, the Armstrong Browning Library, or the ABL as it is also known, is a research center and museum on the campus of Baylor University in Waco, Texas, dedicated to the study of the lives and works of Victorian poets, uh, Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and to the study of 19th century literature and culture more broadly. The ABL provides research and teaching support to Baylor faculty and students and to scholars of the 19th century from around the world. And if you've not already, I hope you will visit our website to learn more about our resources and services, including our Visiting Scholars Program. Our Benefactors Day celebration is an annual event that gives us the opportunity to recognize and thank our donors and friends whose gifts to the library enable us to acquire rare and unique materials for the collection, host outstanding public programming like today's lecture, as well as uh, concerts, conferences, and symposia, provide fellowships and internships to Baylor faculty and students and the broader scholarly community, and undertake renovations and upgrades to library spaces. In particular today, I would like to recognize and thank members of the Lakeside Browning Club in Dallas, Texas. I know some of you are here with us this afternoon. The Lakeside Browning Club recently enabled the ABL to purchase a manuscript in Elizabeth Barrett Browning's hand of her poem, The King's Gift, as well as Charles Dickens' personal copy of her poems before Congress. The gift was given in anticipation of the Lakeside Browning Club's 100th anniversary, which will take place in 2023. Um, these items are now available for use in research and teaching. And for those of you on or near Baylor's campus, the manuscript and book are currently on display in the ABL's hand camera treasure room. So thank you to the Lakeside Browning Club. Now for an overview of today's program. Uh, first, Dr. Joshua King, Associate Professor of English at Baylor and the holder of the Margaret Root Brown Chair in Robert Browning and Victorian Studies, will introduce our speakers, Dr. Marjorie Stone and Dr. Beverly Taylor. After the presentation, Laura J. French, Associate Librarian and Curator of the Armstrong Browning Library, will moderate the Q&A and close our program. If you have questions for our speakers, please feel free to place them in the Q&A box at any time during the talk. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Josh King. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm very excited to be here at this event today. All students of Elizabeth Barrett Browning will recognize the names of Professors Marjorie Stone and Beverly Taylor. They will recognize too that study of Elizabeth Barrett Browning as we know and enjoy it today would be impossible were it not for their extensive illuminating scholarship. Marjorie is McCullough Professor Emeritus of English at Dalhousie University in Canada. And Beverly is Professor of English at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Their scholarship has formed a long and fruitful partnership especially in their co-editorship of several volumes for the five volume, 3000 plus page of works of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Published in 2010, this remarkable achievement remains and will long remain the universally recognized standard scholarly edition of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's works. It's meticulous and lively editorial introductions, footnotes, textual comments, have proven to be lifelines for me and many another scholar and teacher of EBP. Other collaborations by Marjorie and Beverly include their edition of EBP selected poems in 20, 2009, used by my students and many around the world, their co-editorship of a landmark bicentenary issue on EBP for the Journal of Victorian Poetry, and a recent article related to their talk today in the same issue, in the same journal. Marjorie and Beverly complement their collaborative scholarship with a wide body of work on EBB and other writers. Beverly has written books on Arthur Arthurian literature since 1800, the English poet and Catholic mystic Francis Thompson, co-edited books on concepts of the mind in British 
Amer in American Romanticism, and on gender and discourse in Victorian literature and art. And she has written scores of journal articles and book chapters on the Brownings, Carlyle, the Romantic Poets, Tennyson, Arthurian literature, the Paraphylites, Charlotte Bronte, and you can guess much, much more. Marjorie's book on Elizabeth Barrett Browning remains one of the best and most influential. And her co-edited book, Literary Couplings, Writing Couples and the Construction of Authorship is a wonderful collection on a subject still strangely often neglected in literary studies and with obvious special reference to the Brownings. Like Beverly, Marjorie's many journal articles and book chapters increased our knowledge of the Brownings while also ranging widely among writers and subjects such as Tennyson, Elizabeth Gaskell, Christina Rossetti, Toni Morrison, Frederick Douglass, Joseph Massini, and contemporary subjects such as sex trafficking, multiculturalism, and cultural citizenship. I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Marjorie and Beverly a few times, and especially on a conference here at the ABL in 2018 that recognized the 175th anniversary of EBB's protest against child labor, the cry of the children. So we could hardly have better guides than we do today for our exploration of the Browning's courtship, Victorian wedding journeys, and EBB's unpublished honeymoon poem. Please join me in welcoming Marjorie Stone and Beverly Taylor. Thank you very much, Josh, for that Thank very you. generous and kind introduction. Um, I think we're both delighted to be here uh, and speaking on Benefactors Day um, at uh, the Armstrong Browning Library uh, over the years. Um, we both, I think, greatly benefited from the rich resources of this library, its fellowships, the wonderful conferences it's uh, organized. Um, if I can get my PowerPoint to open here, <laughs> I will take us into one of those conferences. Ah, yes. Um, so I hope that's showing for people now. Um, this is a conference in 2006 that uh, marked the uh, bicentenary um, special issue of Victorian poetry, the journal uh, on Elizabeth Barrett Browning, uh, two centuries after her birth, and one of many uh, excellent uh, uh, conferences at uh, ABL. In fact, Beverly and I first met and then started collaborating after a conference at the ABL in the early uh, 1990s. And I just wanted to really emphasize for people out there who are either PhD students working on dissertations, and it can be in any country, or uh, faculty researchers, the ABL's fellowships are really very generous and, uh, and excellent. There are terrific collections of manuscripts and rare books here, and a very a wonderfully welcoming and expert uh, staff. It's a really wonderful place to work. Um, so, uh, should I go on now, Beverly, and start? Yes. Right. <laughs> on September 12th, 1846, an event enshrined in the history of poetry and romance took place in London. A 40-year-old woman slipped quietly out of her family home on Wimpole Street. Her name was Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, or EBB, as she often styled herself in signing letters and in print. Family and close friends called her by her pet name, Ba. EBB was the leading English woman poet of the age. In fact, a transatlantic celebrity following the publication of her two volume 1844 collection titled simply Poems. She had lived in the Wimpole Street house for years in relative seclusion as an invalid, all the while prolifically publishing, corresponding with other writers and interacting with her two sisters, six brothers and their affectionate if domineering father, who in private uh, was termed the governor by her brothers. None of her siblings, all adults, had yet married because of the governor's hostility to the very idea. Now on this fateful day, going to a nearby church, EBB secretly married the poet Robert Browning, six years younger than her, less famous at the time, and less financially secure. Returning home, she shared her secret with her two sisters, but not her father and her brothers. The male members of her family were outraged when they discovered her defiant act only after the newlyweds had left for the continent on September 19th. 
This Zoom presentation arises from our collaborative work on an unpublished poem or fragment of a poem that EVB drafted in the wake of those life altering events. During the Browning's honeymoon, as they traveled southward from London through Paris to Pisa. We term this MS of some 51 lines, the Vaucluse fragment, because it expresses EBB's thoughts and feelings aroused by the Browning's pilgrimage to the fabled fountain long, long associated with Petrarch's sonnets to his beloved Laura. Pausing at Avignon on their journey south, the newlyweds traveled eastward to Vaucluse through a stirring mountain landscape, wilder ever still and wilder as the poem describes it, arriving at the site amidst bristling rock pillars where the river Sorg arises as if from secret springs in a cave under the mountains. In wetter seasons, it tumbles down a ravine. In drier seasons, it forms a peaceful pool. And I just want to uh, show some images of a, uh, this would be the approach to Vaucluse. It probably looked a little bit different in EBB's time, but it is wild country uh, as she describes it. Uh, it has around the, the, the Petrarch's fountain at Vaucluse, there are these very strange geological formations, these towering pillar rocks. This one towers right over the fountain itself. Sometimes the fountain is, and this is how it was when I visited there a few years ago, a beautifully peaceful pool. At other times, and I think this was true when EBB visited it, it, uh, it, uh, it tumbles down uh, a, a ravine uh, um, uh, quite with, with rapids. This is how it looked. This is not a picture from the Victorian times, but it's the earliest one I could find of the water really tumbling down out of the fountain. Um, and this is, these are pictures I took of the fountain below the spring, um, uh, uh, which, they, which they visited. Now, when they visited Vaucluse, for poets keenly aware of Petrarch's importance as the founder of the European love sonnet tradition and lovers who through a long courtship had dreamed of this Vaucluse visit, uh, to actually arrive at Petrarch's fountain was a pivotal moment in a setting suffused with symbolic meaning. As EBB first described the visit to her sister Arabella in mid-October, 1846. Oh, sorry. We made a pilgrimage to Vaucluse as became poets and the enjoyment of the hour spent at the sacred fountain was complete. It stands deep and still and green against a majestic wall of rock and then falls, boils, breaks and foams over the stones down into the channel of the little river. Robert said, bah, are you losing your senses? Because without a word, I made my way over the boiling water, waters to a still rock in the middle of it. But he followed me and helped me and we both sat in the spray. This pilgrimage has figured in biographies of the Brownings ever since. It has also been narrated from the perspective of EBB's famous Spaniel in Vir Virginia Woolf's best-selling novel, Flush, a biography. Uh, this is Flush as she sketched him in one of her little notebooks and this is the cover of Virginia Woolf's novel. And the, the incident has been fictionalized in A.S. by its neo-Victorian romance, Possession. Typically, however, these later versions do not convey the agency EBB expresses in her first account of the visit to Arabella, first published in 1988 in full. Instead, these accounts rely on a secondhand late 19th century story that pictures Mr. Browning chivalrously taking his wife up in his arms and carrying her across the curling waters to seat her on a throne like rock, uh, as if he were a prince and she were a damsel. <clears throat> While EBB's accounts of the Vaucluse visit in her letters have often been cited, the poetic fragment presenting the experience from a more deeply personal and literary perspective lay neglected for over a century and a half in the tiny pocket notebook in which it was first drafted. Its obscurity was no doubt increased by its indecipherability. While the manuscript begins fairly legibly, it mirrors the landscape it describes on the approach to Vaucluse, growing wilder and wilder. You can see it's just a mess on the right-hand page here. 
EBB herself noted that normally her poetry and manuscript was rather like Sanskrit translated into hieroglyphics. However, this draft is exceptionally tangled and possibly was written on the road in a jolting carriage. To address its deciphering challenges in first publishing the Vaucluse fragment in a 2019 Victorian poetry article, we presented two transcriptions. First, a detailed transcription recording cancellations, multiplying insertions and unresolved variants. Then the more readable editorial simplified text we arrived at by suppressing all these cancellations, choosing what appeared to be the latest revisions and considering EBB's compositional process and its contexts. We will present this admittedly interpretive text for discussion in the final third section of this presentation. Intriguingly, the Vaucluse poem departs from accounts of the Vaucluse visit in her letters in notable ways. In sections one and two today, we first address some of the larger historical and biographical contexts that shaped EBB's honeymoon poem. Section one treats the development of honeymoons as a ritual in the 19th century. And the tendency in both academic and popularizing studies to emphasize unhappy Victorian honeymoons contributing to neglect of the Browning's evidently happy experience. Section two considers reasons why the couple successfully negotiated the perils of Victorian honeymoons frequently um, that they frequently entailed, noting in particular the opportunities their prolonged courtship created for developing intimacy. As section three will indicate, however, challenges remained. The very structure of the Vaucluse fragment dramatically registers EBB's transitional state. As the book nurtured visions of her enclosed past life in Wimpole Street give way to her more fully embodied dynamic experiences as a married woman on the road to Italy. Victorian Honeymoons in History and Literature. This is section one. The author of an 1847 conduct book, The Etiquette of Love, Courtship and Marriage, opens a chapter on the wedding tour by remarking, a tour on the continent or a journey to the lakes or some place of fashionable resort has now become a practice which is generally attended to among the middle ranks of life, as well as in fashionable society immediately after the performance of the wedding ceremony. Now, as cultural historians have noted, the honeymoon, initially termed the wedding tour or trip, became a ritual in the 19th century. Indeed, wedding trips became an industry fueled by new models of companionate marriage, the growth of the middle classes and steam powered transportation among other developments. In 1656, Thomas Blout's glossal Graphia defined the honeymoon as an early phase in as an early phase in marriage. It is honey now, but will change at the moon. In 1755, Samuel Johnson's groundbreaking dictionary similarly defined the term as referring to quote that first month after marriage when there is nothing but tenderness and pleasure. Sources differ on precisely when the now dominant sense of honeymoon shifted when the now dominant sense of honeymoon shifted um, to what the Oxford English Dictionary uh, defines as, quote, a holiday taken by a newly married couple traditionally immediately after their wedding. In 1933 in America, Travis Hope could still remark that, quote, honeymoon did not imply a post-wedding pleasure jaunt until recent times. Although Hope also noted that this junket, even if only to Coney Island, had become, quote, as essential as a bouquet or a ring. To omit it would imply that marriage was mere punctuation and only a comma at that. In other words, it would not seem at all proper. Helena Mickey's research for her groundbreaking book, 
Victorian Honeymoon's Journeys to the Conjugal, uh, which is a book we highly recommend, very readable, very helpful to us, indicates that in England, at least, the ritual of a honeymoon trip had spread from the middle and fashionable classes to the upper working classes by the last quarter of the 19th century. As Mickey and others demonstrate, Victorian wedding trips or honeymoons were acts of tourism. And like destination weddings today, they often involved travel, travel to exotic locales. And these locations were often associated with water or water activities. Even if Victorian poorer couples could only afford a day at Brighton, uh, much as Canadian couples today, in the West at least, might go to a simulacrum of a water spot, spot like the Polynesian Room in the Fantasyland Hotel of the West Edmonton Mall in Alberta. As touristic acts, Victorian honeymoons shape material culture in the form of cartoons, conduct books, and guidebooks. And these are discussed by Mickey, Jennifer Fegley, and others. Uh, here's one uh, later, uh, a later edition of a, a guidebook like the one I cited earlier, and you can see it was obviously fairly well used. The Brownings may have brought a poetic sensibility to their honeymoon stop at Petrarch's Fountain, uh, an important kind of water spot or location, but like other newlyweds, they were also consulting their Murray's guidebook. These were the guidebooks that Victorians read when they went to Europe, and following established social scripts. By the mid 19th century, Vaucluse was both a site refracted through the romantic aesthetic of the sublime, and we see that aesthetic, um, we see that aesthetic reflected in this uh, really very beautiful picture by Thomas Cole, a fountain at Vaucluse from 1841, which you can see uh, at the Dallas Museum of Art. So this is one picturing of Vaucluse, which indicates how uh, popular it was and how it was viewed very poetically. But by the mid 19th century, uh, Vaucluse had also become a standard European stop for couples on wedding tours. So in effect, it was a Victorian version of Niagara Falls, although the fountain at Vaucluse was less tackily commercialized and wilder in the Browning's time, I think, than it is today when the whole approach to the fountain is lined with vendors and shops. EBB follows the custom on wedding tours of writing to family and friends about her travel experiences and the romantic sites visited. In many cases, friends and family accompanied or joined the newlyweds in the Victorian period. In the Browning's case, Anna Jameson, she was a well-known art critic and her niece uh, met the Browning's in Paris and were with them at Vaucluse. Jameson's letters and her niece's memoir, adding to EBB's copious correspondence make the Brownings one of the best documented of Victorian honeymoons. However, their wedding journey has attracted little scholarly investigation in part because courtship and the wedding with all of their publicly performed elaborate rituals tend to trump the post-marriage period, which often in films just kind of becomes the fade out. The 1847 edition of the Etiquette of Love, Courtship and Marriage, for example, focuses breathlessly on preparing the bride for, quote, the moment when you will have to exercise submission to him who now gently encloses your hand in his. And when will you, you will be transformed from a maiden into a wife. Here, however, the transforming moment is the marriage ceremony itself, not the wedding tour described in the next chapter or honeymoon consummations it might entail. In Jane Merrill and Chris Philstrup's The Wedding Night of Popular History, the authors note that the 1937 and 1956 film versions of the Barretts of Wimpole Street, which was a film very, very widely reviewed, they note that in both versions of these films, uh, we end up at the church, outside the church with EBB Spaniel waiting by the door. And despite their own focus on the wedding night, Marilyn and Philstrup follow suit in their study. Instead of going on to the Brownies experience following marriage, they return, go back to the courtship and note EBB's romantic yearnings in Sonnet 26 of Sonnets from the Portuguese, where she, she begins, I lived with visions for my company, describing her life in the past. Now focus on the courtship period is doubly reinforced in the case of the Brownings, we believe, by EBB's richly detail, detailed evocation of their unfolding love in this celebrated sequence and the courtship letters that illuminate. And the Sonnets from the Portuguese is 
still her most widely translated and adapted work. A greater reason for relative neglect of the Browning's honeymoon, we believe, is that in Victorian fiction, as in modern studies of vic actual Victorian lives and marriages, emphasis, emphasis falls on unhappy or traumatic experiences. Mickey's wide ranging research on Victorian honeymoon archives reveals a spectrum of actual experiences by married couples from relatively fulfilling ones to more ambivalent responses to what one new wife referred to, quote, as a period altogether the most unpleasant in a girl's life. Despite the spectrum she explores, Mickey opens her book with the observation that, quote, the most famous honeymoon stories are stories about failure, with a glance to Tolstoy, his famous comment about unhappy marriages being the ones that are of narrative interest. Her introduction also pre pre presents George Eliot's portrait of the dejected Dorothea in Rome after she marries the old mole-spotted Kazabon. Uh, she, uh, Mickey presents this as, quote, the primal scene of Victorian fictional honeymoons. Mickey's most extended treatment of Victorian wedding nights or trips in fiction appears in a chapter titled Honeymoon Gothic, and which analyzes what she describes as the secrecy, deceit, and violence embedded in the landscape of the Gothic in works such as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where you'll remember the creature says to Victor Frankenstein, I will be with you on your wedding night, and he somehow doesn't get the message. Uh, Anthony Trollope's The Prime Minister and Thomas Hardy's Test of the Durbervilles. Jennifer Fegley's informative courtship and marriage in Victorian England treats honeymoons more briefly. So you see the pattern there focusing on courtship and marriage more than honeymoons. But Fegley similarly emphasizes what she calls the disastrous honey tri honeymoon trip. Uh, um, she notes the popularity of Gothic short stories, like one titled A Terrible Wedding Trip, uh, in which the new husband is revealed as a murdering lunatic. Uh, she also notes George Gissing's less sensational but chilling story titled The Honeymoon. In another 1879 story titled A Quiet Honeymoon, newlyweds travel to a remote village with their luggage on a pig cart and discover the village is a straggling dead alive sort of place with no inn to stay at. Their trunks are thrown down into the mud amidst the curious pigs, one of which seizes the wife's bonnet, and they're left to dine upon gory slabs of meat from a local shop. Paintings like George Boughton's The Waning Honeymoon from the same period similarly focus on disillusioning experience disillusioning experiences, and here you can already see that the newlyweds are experiencing alienation. Now, often Gothic aspects of honeymoons in Victorian novels are signaled through narrative gaps and suppressions. In Jane Eyre, for example, Rochester skips the honeymoon entirely in narrating his marriage to the Creole Bertha Mason, to Jane. Laura Glyde's letters to home to her foster sister, Marion Halcomb, in Wilkie Collins' novel, The Woman in White, leave Marion in the dark about, quote, her married life during her continental honeymoon tour. After her return, Laura, quote, avoids the forbidden topic, aside from remarking that any woman, quote, is so much better off as a single woman, unless, unless you are very fond of your husband. Similar narrative gaps figure in George Eliot's portrayal of the wedding night experience of Gwendolyn Grandcourt in Daniel Deronda after she receives the toxic gift of the diamond necklace from Grandcourt's uh, jilted mistress, um, Grandcourt's the rather sinister cold man that she's marrying. In treatments of actual not fictional Victorian honeymoons, fraught or unhappy relationships again predominate together with the constructions of Victorian sexual repression these often reinforce. So I think these are very deeply rooted ideas about the Victorians, but there's also this idea that under the sexual repression, there were what one historian calls heaving, they were like heaving volcanoes. In studies of George Eliot, the great novelist, the honeymoon often emphasized is the disastrous, in study story of George Eliot's life, the honeymoon often emphasized is the disastrous honeymoon in which her young husband, John Cross, leaps from the window of their Venetian rooms into the Grand Canal after marrying Elliot, who is a woman 20 years older than he. 
And uh, it, it is honeymoon is often referred to, and critics uh, and historians wonder if the site, if if he was horrified by either the sight of Eliot's body or her possible interest in physical affection uh, with him. So that's a focus, but the deep and fulfilling. Uh, joy of Eliot and her beloved bigamous common law husband, George Henry Lewis, uh, in Germany, and this is earlier in Eliot's life, during the period they regarded as their honeymoon, is less often treated in sensationalizing ways. Now, the Lewis, Lewis, Lewis's were not legally married, of course, uh, but the apparently happy honeymoons of uh, Alfred Tennyson and his wife and Elizabeth Gaskell and her husband in England, like the Browning's honeymoon, have also attracted little interest. In contrast, the unconsummated marriage of the great Victorian art critic John Ruskin and his young wife Effie Gray repeatedly figures in histories of Victorian marriage and sexuality. For example, in Fegley's book on courtship and marriage, she draws parallels between Gothic honeymoon fiction and short stories and the story of the Ruskins uh, and the speculations that Effie's naked body and pubic hair inspired a kind of Gothic dread or revulsion in her husband. As Mickey's more detailed analysis of the Ruskins indicates, their case is so often invoked even though it relies upon speculative evidence, because as she puts it, John and Effie's activities and motivations on a particular April night of 1848, their wedding night, have been made to stand in for the larger unresolved mysteries of Victorian honeymoons. Many such mysteries remain unresolved because of the reticence of Victorian archives concerning sexual intimacies. Mickey's comprehensive research of the papers relating to 61 couples yields only seven references or series of references to sex. This very absence of materials, however, combined with historical stereotypes of, Victor of Victorian sexuality contributes to, I think, the negative spin often given to these mysteries. For example, Stephanie Kuntz popularizing book, Marriage, A History, How Love Conquered Marriage, acknowledges that despite the view many women had of men as, quote, the grosser sex, some Victorian husbands and wives developed satisfactory, even joyful sex lives. So she makes this observation, but revealingly, however, Kuntz does not discuss examples of these joyful sexual lives, which some other historians do, such as Queen Victoria's description of her, quote, bliss beyond belief at Prince Albert's endearments, or Charles and Fanny Kingsley's pleasure in what Fanny termed their delicious nightery. Instead, Kuntz immediately emphasizes, after acknowledging that Victorian husbands and wives could have joyful sex lives, she emphasizes, for many women brought up with the idea that normal females should lack sexual passion, the wedding night was a source of anxiety and disgust. Now, even though many might expect such a response in the 40-year-old, physically frail uh, Miss Barrett, given uh, EBB, given the stereotypical constructions of her in popular culture as the prim Miss Barrett, uh, we see that in Miss Barrett, the film, The Barretts of Wimpole Street. Uh, even though we have these stereotypical cons cons constructions of EBB as Miss Barrett, the Browning's love letters point to her very different response to uh, awakening erotic desire during th their courtship and to sexual passion uh, in the honeymoon period. And now I'm going to hand over to Beverly for the second uh, part of this paper. This is on Victorian honeymoons and the case of the Brownings. In marked contrast to the scholarly and popular focus on disastrous honeymoons in Victorian biography and fiction, the Brownings represent a counterexample of a honeymoon that by all accounts was happy, harmonious, and fulfilling in multiple ways, despite the fraught conditions created by their respective ages and EBB's physical frailty, by the family upheaval following her marriage and the couple's exciting but also exhausting to travel to Italy and Victorian perceptions of the body. On the one hand, EBB suffered crushing guilt over her filial ingratitude and her transgression of conventions by marrying without her family's knowledge. 
On the other hand, she suffered even greater fear that if her father learned of her plans, his rage would daunt her into forsaking them. Her closest male relatives, including her six brothers, were intensely opposed to her marriage, in part because some regarded Mr. Browning as a gold digger. Mr. Barrett never forgave his eldest daughter for marrying and leaving home in secret. He never read her conciliatory letters or Robert's, never spoke to their son Penn when he discovered this grandchild in his house at Wimpole Street, and never reconciled with EBB before he died in 1857. Given all this emotional conflict and psychological baggage, the happiness of the Browning's honeymoon seems all the more remarkable, especially considering other inauspicious facts. As a 40-year-old reclusive invalid spinster, EBB married a robust, gregarious man of 34 who lived with his parents and impetuously declared that he loved her for her poetry's fresh, strange music and true new brave thought in his first letter to her in January 1845, months before they actually met in person. Moreover, EBB enjoyed a greater literary reputation than he did, yet their honeymoon harmony overcame all these impediments. As Mickey argues in Victorian honeymoons, wedding trips primarily function to establish the newly married couple as a discrete unit by isolating them from the family and from friends important to them separately in their single state. The goal in Mickey's words was to create a conjugal unit that was to become their primary source of social and emotional identification producing a couple newly aligned with one another and with Victorian ideals of intimacy and sexuality, while also rewriting relations to family and community. Similar functions for the honeymoon are noted by 20th century social scientists, including development of future coping and adaptive strategies, competence to participate in an appropriate sexual relationship, uh, competence to live in close association with one's marital partner, and development of mutually satisfactory shared experience as the basis for the marital relationship. In the case of Elizabeth and Robert, much of this work had already been accomplished in London throughout their courtship. Her sick room isolation from the rhythms of family life and from life beyond the household encouraged intimate bonding between the lovers, intensified by her father's inflexible opposition to any of his grown children marrying and to the idea of her traveling to Italy to seek a more healthful climate. Their, uh, the Browning's many afternoon meetings without chaperones and witnesses in her bed sitting room interspersed with increasingly intimate letters enabled them to move towards frank discussion of the life they would build together. About two months before they married, for example, R.B. confessed to E.B.B., to whom I tell everything he wrote, that he needed a separate dressing room because, as he wrote, I could not take off my coat before you now or brush my hair and wash my face before my own father. Their growing candor during the courtship also enabled them to move towards erotically embodied notions of their relationship as they simultaneously developed fuller understanding of their artistic, intellectual, and religious compatibility. By the time they had corresponded for just over a year, they would agree that you can't kiss mind. And their letters are full of kissing. While EBB rather demurely distills this facet of their relationship in Sonnet 38 of Sonnets from the Portuguese by describing Robert's first kissing her hand, subsequently her forehead, and then finally her lips, his letters seem nearly obsessed with kissing. In the final six months of their correspondence, as they discuss their plans to marry and travel, 
he is metaphorically kissing her when her letters arrive and again before he sends off his missives to her. He metaphorically kisses her hands, her forehead, her eyes, her lips, her hem, her feet, and the ground beneath her feet. Increasingly, moreover, his letters indicate that the kisses are not all metaphorical and that their embracing has become common. As he writes, I think if you were here, I should lay my head on your bosom and never raise it again. More concretely, he recalls their embodied experience. If I put aside the poet and only see my dearest, dearest lady of that hair and eyes and hands and voice and all the completeness that was trusted to my arms yesterday, while Robert's invocation of EBB as his dearest lady here might suggest the idealized lady of Petrarch's sonnets, it is a flesh and blood woman he speaks of embracing. Such embraces explain apprehensive queries in his letters about who opened the door during their last meeting. Despite his usual decorum, he also anticipated their impending married life when he would be served by you, loved by you, made happy by you. Though he associates this service and love with her being an angel, he imagines there might be archangels. He also implies his physical conception of this higher form of loving involving the body as well as the heart and mind. EBB's remarks are less physically concrete than Robert's, and their discussion of exchanging locks of hair suggests her greater physical reticence. Her injunction that Robert never speak about this topic of exchanging locks of hair when they meet implies that she regarded exchanging hair as being just as unspeakable in polite company as sex would be. If EBB did not write overtly of her erotic experience, she nonetheless gave evidence that she was not prudish. With considerable irony, two days after she married Robert but returned to her paternal home, she reported to him that her father had once declared her the purest woman he ever knew. The remark amused her now because she understood him to mean that I had not troubled him with the iniquity of love affairs or any impropriety of seeming to think about being married. Nearly a decade after the Browning's marriage, Anna Jameson, who had accompanied them to Vaucluse, wrote to EBB appreciatively about the French novelist George Sand's ability to sketch a picture of the true sectional, sexual relationship. Jameson's candid assessment of Sand's ability recalls her own, EBB's own early enthusiasm for the writer whom she regarded as a genius and her critiques of attitude she associated with La Prude Angleterre. George Sand and the like immortal proprieties, EBB claimed, had kept the color in my life to some degree during her convalescence in the early 1840s. They had ministered to me through the prison bars of the sick room. She described French novelists, especially Sand and Honoré de Balzac, Balzac, as creating such a conflagration of sex and violence that English literature seemed neutral, tinted, and dull and cold by comparison. Such reading helped her develop what Arby's biographers Irvine and Honan identify as a common sense attitude towards sex and the hypocrisies of her time. Both Brownings also knew treatments of eroticism, including lesbian and homosexual eroticism in Greek and Latin literature from Sappho to Anacreon and Ovid. Obviously reading experience alone does not ensure happy transition to conjugal relations. Other Victorians such as Ruskin presumably had similar abstract experience through literature. But EBB's knowledge of classical literature and, and European languages offered exposure to sexual realities that less adventurous English readers would have lacked. <laughs>
Despite the physicality referenced in their courtship correspondence, however, both Brownings describe their relationship using metaphors of dreamscape distinguishing the imaginative and emotional possibilities of romantic experience from the everyday realities EBB associated with her cage bird life before Robert entered the picture. She speaks of, her, of his coming into her life as being like a dream and declares dreamland to be his especial dominion. At the same time, she distinguished the dreamscape of their love from the crass materialistic reality she discerned in many fashionable marriages. Denouncing the monstrous version of love that in most marriages reduced to a stark formula, a man admires a woman for being pretty or for some personal quality, and she admires him for admiring her. EBB acerbically described matches undertaken for the glories of bridocracy, such as the trousseau, and anticipated the misery of such marriages, remarking, take two instruments which have not been tuned together and play them in concert and stop your ears against the discord. In effect, the Browning's courtship correspondence written over a period of about 21 months reveals the two poets tuning themselves to play in concert. If their harmony arose initially from dreamland, their range of topics and confluence of thoughts and feelings allowed them to sing in the real world as they termed it, song to song. That said, the transition from dreams to reality was not without its tensions. Months after they had agreed to marry, EBB still associated their love with dreams and doubted the reality of their relationship and future, repeatedly referring to Robert's love as a mirage, likely to evaporate. The natural first thought, the recurring dream fear. By March 1846, when they had begun to plan their marriage and continental travels, she remained anxious about the dream's ephemerality. I look to this dream and fear for the vanishing. This language of dreaming permeates her letters. I feel to myself sometimes, do not move, do not speak, or the dream will vanish. So fearfully like a dream it is, like an actual old, old dream of my own. She wrote just a month before they married. Her characterizations of dreamland and the miracle of Robert's love suggests that she often judged what seems to us materially real and ordinary to be the stuff of dreams, an inversion that arose from her life having contracted for years to an invalid's enclosure in a single room. When she practiced leaving that room and her house, she sometimes found sensations ordinary to most people to be extraordinary. Walking in Regent's Park, for example, when she strayed from the path to gather a sprig of laburnum to send Robert, placing her feet on the grass was the strangest feeling. It made her feel joyful, like a bit of that dreamland she associates with Robert. Elsewhere, she expresses the joyful dream of his love in an exquisite metaphor judging Robert's loving her to be the only one miracle for me. She deems everything else under the sun and much over it to be the merest commonplace and workday matter of fact, so much so that if I found myself suddenly riding in paradise on a white elephant of golden feet, I should shake the bridle with ever so much nonchalance. But just over two weeks before they wed, as she and Robert worked out details for their marriage and departure from England, thereby ensuring the inevitably painful rupture with her father, she struggled to accommodate love's dream world to life's realities. It all seemed too earnest for the mere dream I have been dreaming all this while. Is it not a dream or what? And just two days before they married, she worried, Will not this dream break on a sudden? Now is the moment for the breaking of it, surely.
EBB deployed the language of dreaming so often that Robert picked it up as well, first proposing a celibate marriage, which would enable him to visit her more frequently at Wimpole Street, caring for her as a brother. Now, while I dream, he wrote, let me once dream. I would marry you now and thus. I would come when you let me and go when you bade me. I would be no more than one of your brothers. I deliberately choose the realization of that dream rather than of any other excluding you. But he soon set aside this fantasy, urging a more insistently embodied conception of their love, which perhaps explains his hyperbolic references to kissing. I would not have dared to take the blessing of kissing your hand, much less your lip, he explained, but that it seemed as if I was leading you into a mistake and that you might fancy I only felt a dreamy abstract passion for a phantom of my own creating out of your books and letters and which only took your name. As though to confirm the physical reality of their love while using delicately oblique language, he anticipated that they might produce a child, a brighter, better possibility than her early death, who would be a claimant on any money she might want to bequeath. Even after the Brownings had married and arrived on the continent, exhausted following a miserable channel crossing, she repeatedly recurred to the language of vision and dream, paradoxically to convey her vivid new life. In the diligence on the road to Rouen, mesmerized by wild and loosely harnessed horses with manes leaping, creating a fantastic scene in the moonlight, she was so feverish with fatigue, she wrote to Arabella, that I began to see it all as in a vision and to doubt whether I was in or out of body. She uses similar terms in writing to Mary Russell Mitford on the 2nd of October after the Browning's week in Paris, describing her new relationship with Robert as like a dream of my guardian angel. She shifts to a more realistic acknowledgement of how exhausted she was by the emotion and fatigue of the secret marriage and travel, commenting, if it had been a dream, the pain of some parts of it would have awakened me before now. It is not a dream. Yet in the next paragraph, she exclaims of her time in Paris, such a strange week it was, altogether like a vision. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, scarcely. Her franker letter to Arabella, written during, not after the Browning's week in Paris, implies why she wrote of living there both in and out of the body with a visionary intensity. Reassuring Arabella that she and Robert are well, she writes of living as in a dream, loving and being loved better every day, seeing near in him all that I seem to see afar, thinking with one thought, feeling with one heart. Her piquant likening of this quiet new life with Robert in Paris to riding an enchanted horse implies that the Brownings had harmoniously and happily consummated their relationship there, feeling with one heart. Less than two weeks later, however, on October 8th, they visited Petrarch's fountain at Vaucluse. In the poetic fragment arising from this visit, we encounter another expression of the tension between romantic dreamscapes and the realities that pervades Ebibi's courtship and honeymoon letters. We also glimpse how she was working through this opposition towards the more grounded aesthetic that characterizes her later poetry. Marjorie, you're on. All right, and this is section three, the Vaucluse manuscript from dreamscapes to a wilder ever landscape. The Vaucluse manuscript opens with what appears to be a double false start. E.B. first wrote, we went to Vaucluse, uh, as indicated in the detailed pen stroke by pen stroke transcription of the manuscript we present in our 2019 article in Victorian poetry. But she then canceled this simple direct opening, uh, drawing a line through the words and opened with the following six lines of iambic pentameter. <clears throat> 
I did not think to see, except in dreams, the fountain which old Petrarch sang beside, but life and fancy touch at some extremes, and where the bank is steepest and no tried pathway is found, we step the quietest down and stand just in the flowers upon our feet. These uncanceled lines announce a contrast between life and fancy, the present scene and the speaker's past dreams. And this contrast is unfolded more fully and dynamically in the fragments remaining five stanzas. Nevertheless, based on features of the manuscript and, uh, and EBB's characteristic compositional practices in her many, many, many manuscripts, we believe that she planned to discard these opening lines, even though she hasn't drawn a line through them. Firstly, she inserted the number one before the stanza that follows them. Secondly, she switched at this point in the, in the MS from pencil to ink over pencil, as she often does when she moves into a more concerted composition of a poem. Thirdly, and perhaps most tellingly, the meter rhyme scheme and stanza form change at this point to a more intricately structured nine line pattern in trochaic rhythm, stressed, unstressed, maintained throughout the, re the remainder of the poem. We render these five stanzas as follows in our interpretive translation of her MS hieroglyphics in, uh, in uh, Victorian poetry, the journal. And you can see the number one she's inserted there. Shall I tell you how I saw Petrarch's fountain? Um, sorry, I should have just paused with this. You can see she was writing in pencil at the beginning here and then shifts into ink over pencil. Shall I tell you how I saw Petrarch's fountain of Vaucluse? Not by help of any muse, nor of a dream law. Such things in, may in dreams be viewed. I have known it by long use but the heart aches afterward with the fugitive regard and the sweet is changed to bitter in the endless solitude. But it was not in the turning of two pages while the book slides and drops down and your look which grows deeper and more burning than a poor, mere poor readers may that I gazed where Petrarch shook his bright soul out in sweet sound of wild rocks that so have drowned their own fountain's voice, which have channeled with their fountain the best music of a man. And then suddenly an abrupt shift in the poem. We had come from Avignon with the wind against our brows and the clouds in wavy rows looking ready to be blown in the real solemn sky that should actually be in the wild and wet sky because she revised that line amongst many others. We drove on through fair wild places, vines and olives looking still grayer from the grayness of the air. The yellow vines had lost their grapes and swung loose and brokenly. But approaching to Vaucluse, it grew wilder. The great hills vindicate their solemn wills from the verdure they refuse to go barely up to heaven. Bear as arm when it kills, bear as gladiators when they strip to the scorn upon their lip, bear as spirits when God calls them rush to judgment with the seven. Wilder ever still, and wilder through the hillside serried leapt the rocks, seemed to leap up at the shocks of the mountain life scarce milder than our human. Goats were grazing, shepherded in straggling flocks by one maid alone, and great black eyes of astonishment on us who passed and possibly by the fragment uh, ending here. Um, this, five, go, go ahead. Okay. this five stanza poem expresses and stylistically embodies a dynamic turn away from EBB's reiterated references in her letters to Robert and their love as manifestations of dreamland. And also from the dream law she associates with Petrarch love and literature dreaming over books in stanzas one and two. These stanzas develop the static opposition between life and fancy she sets up in the six lines she initially drafted, but in more energetic and personalized terms. 
Shall I tell you how I saw Petrarch's fountain of Vaucluse, the speaker asks, as EBB sounds the depths of her own past bittersweet dreams in endless solitude. Stanza three then veers out of the visionary landscape and soundscape of Petrarch's fountain evoked in stanza two and back in time to represent the Browning's travel through a realistically rendered landscape on the approach to Vaucluse. Here EBB vividly evokes a mobile, palpably physical world of wind felt on faces, blown clouds in a wet, wide and wet gray sky, and dying vines swinging loose and brokenly. Stanzas four and five of the Vaucluse poem intensify the realism of stanza three as EBB accentuates the stark gray rocks and the lack of vegetation. The great hills, she writes, refuse verdure to go barely up to heaven. And this is something that she emphasizes in her letters describing the scene that there's no greenery around, though the photographs we've seen taken more recently show lots of greenery. In Life and Fancy, in the Life and Fancy initial opening that she abandoned, she seems to have begun a more conventional love poem, employing a stock metaphor by having her speaker, herself, standing in flowers that a conventional poetess might have invoked to commemorate her love. In contrast, in stanzas four and five of this poem, EBB emphatically ignores the pretty imagery of hearts and flowers that a poetess might employ in a honeymoon poem. Instead, she describes the wilder, ever still and wilder hills using metaphors of militant masculine gladiators stripping to the scorn upon their lip as they face the arena's brutal testing and prepare for higher divine judgment. As we discuss more fully in our Victorian poetry article, the stripping gladiators and leaping rocks she associates with this wild mountain life suggests that the landscape as she describes it is eroticized in a way Nikki finds typical of Victorian honeymoon discourse. However, EBB's honeymoon poem does not reflect the usual gendered binaries encountered in such writing. Instead, she seems to develop the harsh landscape surrounding Vaucluse through metaphors that convey the Browning's conjugal defiance of her judgmental father and brothers and the couple's triumphant persistence in choosing their own path and lives. Eight days before the poets visited Vaucluse, E.B. being learned painfully from the letters awaiting her in Orléans that not only her father, but also her brothers harshly condemned her secret marriage. Clearly, these communications must have complicated psy psychic conflict she experienced during the honeymoon period and intensified her sense that an arena of hostile spectators were judging her choices and actions. Meaningfully, she immediately juxtaposes references to the militant gladiators against the cleansing agony undergone by spirits who rush to judgment as God calls them to a reckoning that will affirm their righteousness and promises to exonerate and validate their actions. Recalling EBB's joy at simply standing on grass in Regent's Park, we can imagine more forcibly the courage and spirit manifested in her marrying Robert against all the risky odds we earlier indicated. This spirit is also manifested in her act of entering the turbulent waters beneath Petrarch's fountain, where with her husband's help, she seated herself as though on a throne associated with the poet Petrarch. This stone as throne provides a brave emblem of the new life she embraced for her representation of the harsh bare landscape surrounding Vaucluse in, indicates her realization that their lives together would not be a life of fancy and flowers that she were more conventionally described in literary dreams and in honeymoon poems. In the final lines of the Vaucluse fragment, the drama of EBB's life paralleled by the blustery scene of the forbidding landscape 
yields ultimately to the unremarkable ordinariness of straggling goats grazing a hillside witnessed by a somnolent girl goat herder. In other words, this poem she chose this poem she chose not to publish affirms EBB's conviction in 1846 that the Browning's conjugal journey together would continue despite the drama within the Barrett family caused by her passionate but also considered self-assertion. Closing with an image of a maiden half asleep upon a stone, not the comfortable but imprisoning sofa where the invalid EBB had dreamed over pages of a book. EBB leaves us to ponder the relation of this unsophisticated maiden to the daring woman who has chosen to undertake a newly mobile life, married life, in a challenging landscape. We may share the girls and EBB's astonishment at finding this poet who liberated herself from her invalid's isolation in London, actually sitting with Robert in the spray of the river on her throne-like stone in Petrarch's Fountain of Vaucluse. Thank you. So I think we'd like to encourage you all to ask questions now. We have a discussion, a little bit of time left for discussion. We would welcome questions because there hasn't really been much critical discussion of this poem yet, <laughs> um, or dissection of how we transcribe it, <laughs> which we may expect as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Stone and Taylor, for sharing your insights into the Browning's honeymoon and Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Bacluse fragment. Um, this is Laura French, the Armstrong Browning Library's curator, and I will be moderating the questions for Dr. Stone and Dr. Taylor about, about this presentation. If you do have questions, please submit them through the Q&A section on your screen. Um, and feel free to do so now or at any time in the next few minutes. So to get us started, this presentation and a lot of the research you've done for this and the article that went into it was prompted by your first interactions with the recluse fragment. Do you mind telling us a little bit about when, if you, when you first became aware of the fragment and what your initial reactions were to it? <laughs> If you years ago, it. right, Beverly? Years ago, <laughs> before, <laughs> before the Pickering and Chattel uh, edition came out in 2010, we were traveling around to different special collections with Sandra Donaldson, the general editor of that uh, uh, um, edition, and uh, you know, trying to make transcriptions of EBB's many, 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 many unpublished poems. And this was the toughest, I think, one <laughs> we encountered, um, and we would. We just couldn't make sense of it. <laughs> and we must have worked on it for weeks and weeks and weeks and months, all told, but it was at intervals over time. Beverly, maybe you want to speak to it with our, with our, um, our magnifying. Uh, magnifying glasses to read her, yeah. uh, read her tiny, tiny uh, writing in tiny notebooks. Yeah, I think that's a point we can't emphasize enough is how small her writing is and how messy this manuscript is. So there are things crossed off and carrots with insertions and duplicate lines, and it's just a wreck. So we could not make it out. We just physically couldn't read it. And of course, when we had started reading her manuscripts, our eyesight was younger and better. So we were sort of aging out of the possibility of making any sense of this manuscript at all, but we couldn't do it by the time that the works of Elizabeth Barrett Browning was published. So this was the only manuscript that we were not able to include. That, that we knew we of at that time. To turning up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but we I kept that. You can't really tell from the image that we put up on the screen, but, uh, it is such a dense, dense, dense tangle of lines. So if, if people are interested in that, they can look at what, what we call the diplomatic or detailed transcription attempt to make that in uh, the, the journal article, Victorian Poetry. Um, uh, because there's just so many, like 
you, you'll think that there are three lines and in fact you realize it's one line and there are you know other words are inserted above and below it uh it's hard to even see the stanza structures in the tangle of lines on the page it took me a long time to see that nine nine uh line stanza structure pattern i don't know about you beverly um yeah uh, and the other problem is one hint should be rhymes at the ends of lines that that should tell us where the end of a line is. But EBB is so no notoriously committed to using slant rhymes, imperfect rhymes. So there's not always a clear hint. So it was complicated. And she still, and is, probably, sorry, go ahead. It is a fragment, you know, it is a draft, very rough draft. So she's just, she's still working out ideas. So the rhymes aren't perfect uh, at times. Um, you can see that she's trying to get, you know, a better phrasing or the meter's not perfectly developed. Um, um, so we decided, that's why we decided we had to do a detailed transcription of the hieroglyphics and then translate the translation <laughs> in the Victorian poetry article. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing with us that. Um, moving to the first question that's, that came in for you during the course of the presentation uh, was looking at the happy honeymoon and the narrative challenge that of representing a, a happy honeymoon for many 19th century novelists. Um, could the lack of major incidents deter 19th century novelists from talking about a happy honeymoon? And do you think, um, why do you think 19th century novelists would skip over the honeymoon or the honeymoon phase so often? Well, I think that's an interesting question. I should say, I don't consider myself an expert on Victorian honeymoons. Helena Mickey is, and there are people who are. We just got interested in this from working on this poem. Uh, I do think there's a lot less to work with for honeymoons uh, than there is for courtship and marriage. Uh, even though a couple's kind of on display during the honeymoon period, you know, as the bride wears her lovely dresses from her trousseau and they travel along in the Victorian period, often with companions and friends, there's still the most important aspects of the honeymoon are often private, right? There's, it, it's what's going on between this new, new couple in private. Um, so, and as we, as, as Helen and Mickey's research confirms, Victorian, Victorians are very reticent about these matters. So there just isn't nearly as much to work with as there is for, you know, the courtships, the elaborate courtships rituals of Victorian, uh, the Victorian age. You know, there were handbooks on, on uh, handkerchief flirtations, for example, and other things like that. So there are all these elaborate rituals that goes on for a long time. And then, the, and then you, you build up to the kind of wedding that EBB was so critical of when she was critical of the bridocracy and the, you know, assembling the trousseau and putting it all on display. Anyway, Beverly, do you have any thoughts on this and why there isn't so much in uh, Victorian fiction, at least, that we, that we know of? Yeah, well, I think it's being with, out of a sense of privacy that you're not going to talk about your happy consummation of your love. So that's why I love reading about EBB's reading in her letters, references to the honeymoon in metaphors, like uh, riding the, what kind of horse Enchanted is it? Enchanted horse. Enchanted yeah. horse. Yeah. So she's talking about, I mean, she's conveying the sense of movement even in that consummation, but she's not talking about it in the way that people would have taken offense at. Even her sister, I think her sister Arabella was easily offended. And EBB is constantly having to write to retract or modify something she said in the previous letter, but she didn't have to do that in describing her honeymoon. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, multiple questions, have to choose <laughs> which one to present first. Um, so, if EBB did not publish the poem because of its sexual and personal undertones, might she have found um, through the erotically suggestive and embodied stanzas in, three, in stanzas three through five a way of developing poetics more affirmative to the erotic body and ways that anticipate uh, passages in Aurora Lee? Huh? I think that's a good question. That's an excellent question. And I think the, the asker is right on <laughs> that, yeah. 
um, you, I mean, you see a, a very frank sort of uh, sensuality in Aurora Lee. When, uh, when Aurora and Romney finally get together at the end, they have this long, long, long embrace and passionate kiss. And it's like a convulsion, it's described as a convulsion. Um, so uh, there is a kind of embodied uh, sexuality there. And I do think maybe you can see the beginnings of it in, in a very private, I think this is a private manuscript and a private poem, maybe. Uh, that, that's the whole interesting question of why she didn't work, develop it and publish it. Um, Beverly, do you have thoughts on this? Well, an interesting detail to connect with what you just said is that both she and Robert chose images from this poem to work into their much later verse right. in a completely different context. So it's not personal and it's not directly sexual. Yeah. That's right. There is a reference to the goat herds, the little little um, uh, little girl uh, guarding the sheep in, uh, or not guarding them because she's falling asleep. In in this poem, it's in Aurora Lee, but it's in Romney actually refers to this uh, uh, little little girl uh, sheep herder, and the whole context makes it incredibly complex and ironic, and it's such an interesting example of. Uh, both the Brownings obviously knew that she had written this Bull Clues fragment. Robert actually refers to, refers to the River Sorg in a later poem and rhymes it with morgue, the Paris morgue. Uh, so the Brownings were aware of this fragment and certainly the visit was very important in their lives. Uh, and they kind of allude to it in later poems, but in contexts that where you would never recognize that there's a kind of personal, uh, you know, hidden sort of thing going on here. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, could you talk a bit more about the rhyme scheme in the poem? Do you think EBB is situating it in relation to traditional sonnet rhyme schemes? That was something else I think we realized and put in the Victorian poetry article that there is this intricate rhyme scheme once she gets into the nine line pattern, but the opening, it's like ABBA, which is the rhyme scheme of Petrarchan sonnets. And I don't think that is maybe accidental <laughs> in a writer as sophisticated as EBB. What would you say, Beverly? You, you oh, absolutely. But of course, than I am. <laughs> she, she drops that pattern, though, after the opening lines. And so she's referencing it, but asserting her independence from it. Oh, the, the opening lines, right? No, I mean the opening lines of each stanza, the ABBA. She'll right. do that, but then she varies from right. the Petrarchan. Right, she varies it. And then you get that wonderful long final line in each of the stanzas. It's actually quite an unusual uh, stanza form, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think we have to recognize that she was very inventive in terms of her poetics in that way. She liked, I found that she had a habit of invoking an established literary pattern, then to violate it or to depart from it. So it's kind of a literary showing off. See, I know this pattern and I can do that, but now I'm gonna do my own thing. That's the message that I take away from it. I think she also had a very keen understanding of the relationship between sound and sense. So form isn't something rigid that you impose on a poem. Uh, it's she, I think, subscribed to the, the romantic poet Samuel Coleridge's conception of what he called organic form. It grows from within, it's individual to each poem, it shapes itself. And so each poem, uh, even if it's written in a particular kind of more standard form, you can see her playing around with the form in ways that speaks to the meaning. Uh, so if sometimes, for example, she created a, diff, a d deliberate metrical discord in a line where she's referring to a, a kind of discord in terms of the content. Uh, I can't think of a precise example right now, but there certainly are examples like this. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question is uh, referring to the sense of vast space that the fragment poem evokes, particularly when compared to the, um, the love sonnets and the confined space that the speaker writes from within the sonnets of the Portuguese. Yet within the fragment, she also refers back to a previous place. So are there any other thoughts that you have regarding the sonnets of the Portuguese as well as this fragment and how they might play off each other? 
I think that's a very astute observation. And I think uh, we know from reading the courtship correspondence that moving out into the world was kind of a terrifying thing for EBB coming out of her invalid seclusion. And um, she had not been a pathetic invalid for at least, what, four years before she married and left. So, but she had continued a life she had started and that enabled her to have plenty of time to write a kind of, it sheltered her from unwanted visits, even from her own brother. She organized them so that they visited her. They made a group visit to her room once a week so that she wouldn't have them all dropping in at random times. So we know she used her isolation to her own benefit as a writer. Uh, but at the same time, when she was planning to go to the continent to marry, she um, took dry runs out in the open world to get used to it, to get used to the noise, to get used to the sights. Uh, and it was scary because she hadn't been doing that for many years. Yeah, I think that's why there was a kind of almost surrealistic intensity to some of her experiences, like that description, which I find quite powerful in the courtship letters of the, of, you know, the riding in the in the in the diligence with the wild galloping horses in the moonlight, and it's just also intense. For her. you can imagine, though, if someone had lived in fairly closed rooms in a closed room for years and years, and Victorian houses are kind of closed anyway, uh, uh, she would experience a kind of sensory overload, as she does, I think, when she goes even to walk in the park. So you can imagine, like being exposed to all of the things she was exposed to in traveling from London to, you know, uh, 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 through Paris uh, down down to uh, Vaucluse. Uh, and I, I think what's when I first when I first was able to make out what this fragment seemed to be about, what most struck me was the open, the openness of it, that huge white, wide and wet sky, the open road, the sense of energy, the feeling of wind on her face, uh, all very vividly, vividly conveyed. And I think the questioner who asked about the contrast with the sonnets is, is so interesting because the sonnets are in very, would you say, would you say they are Beverly in very enclosed spaces? There well, are... yeah. So Wordsworth's poem about the sonnet likens it to a, a nun's small room. Itself, right, it's like a nun's room. But but the the sort of spaces within the sonnets and the portuguese or the spaces that are evoked are interior spaces, I think, more. Uh, mm -hmm. Not certainly this wonderful sense of the open road that you get here where it's almost like she's Jack Kerouac suddenly you know on the road and experiencing an entirely different world uh, not in a kind of you know romantic escape this is great sort of way but I think there's a, a lot of other complicated stuff going on which we talked about the sort of conflict with her family etc right right so Thank you so much for responding to those questions. Um, do we have time for one really quick last question? Mm -hmm. so then then um, if you could finish with, uh, do you have any sense of why Elizabeth might not have finished or published this poem? Um, for context, the idea that it took her so long to wait to share her love sonnets with Robert and you, um, you've expressed the idea that she shared this poem with Robert and he was aware of it relatively early on or as it was being composed potentially. Um, so why, um, why it would not have been published because of the sense of personal feelings or not important enough for publication or um, not poetic enough? I, I'm not so sure Robert knew about it early on. I suspect that she might have um, not shown it to Robert. I don't know. The Brownings were actually, took... yeah, because she, you're quite right that, that she wrote the sonnets from the Portuguese during the courtship period, but she didn't even tell Robert that she'd written them. It wasn't until 1849 when his mother died that she brought out the sonnets uh, and he insisted that they be published. Uh, this is, I think, uh, this is not a finished poem. I'm not even sure it's a fragment. It might be a complete poem in itself. I don't know what you think, Beverly. I, I, I sort of contemplate this sometimes. But well, it, it is, would be complete if we could read the final word, which we can. <laughs> right, we couldn't read it. Trails off at the bottom of the page. It might be by. Uh, <laughs> um, 
But it is, I think, that uh, there's a study by Donald Ryman on manuscripts, and it's a very interesting study. He talks about uh, there are public, confidential, and private manuscripts. And this is a private, I think this is a kind of private manuscript. Now, but she could have worked it up into something that would have become a publishable poem. And I think it would have been a very striking poem for the times, but she didn't. Uh, I don't think Robert would have liked it <laughs> if she had published it. <laughs> no, he was very much against self-revelation in poetry. And um, I mean, that's why it's so striking that he insisted Sonnets from the Portuguese be published because as he put it, it, it was a strange heavy crown he, he was burdened by that revelation, but he also recognized they were very fine poems, but he was against publishing personal stuff. Well, so in fact, and he was against even Shakespeare's sonnets because he, he alludes in, in one poem called, I think it's House, House, to Shakespeare, with this key, Shakespeare unlocked his heart. And he says, well, the less Shakespeare he, uh, you know, you shouldn't unlock your heart in a sonnet. And Robert actually burned most of, many of his draft manuscripts and, and letters and things. Uh, he didn't want them left. She kept a lot of her draft manuscripts and her family kept them, which is why there's such troves of them now, although they're all over the place. So there were kind of different views there of what should be private and what should be public. Um, I think she kept every scrap of paper she ever had, as far as I can tell. In the Burke collection in the New York Public Library, I came across a bundle of papers of her works from scraps. the Juvenilia called Scraps. <laughs> she wrote on the outside of it, Scraps. So she was keeping scraps. Uh, yes, okay. thank you so much for sharing that. And it, it is especially striking to consider this, this manuscript in light of the sonnets from the Portuguese and, mm -hmm. and that. So um, thank you once again for, to your, for today and um, for sharing your time and your insights with us. A recording of today's program will be available on the Baylor websites in the next few weeks. Um, and so before signing off from the Armstrong Browning Library, I would like to thank Nathan Landers for his work preparing and orchestrating the technology that made today's Virtual Benefactors Day program possible, and Carl Flynn and his team for preparing the promotional materials and helping the Armstrong Browning Library spread the word about today's program, and for each of you, our audience members, for making time in your busy schedule to join us virtually. For Baylor students attending our program to earn creative art experience credit, there will be a QR code at the very end of the program, which you can scan. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.